I, I am here with my friend Matt, the Emergent Daily Scrum with Crazy on, and we're here talking about project management basis. So I wanted to talk about the very base of project management so that you can get your focus and know where to put everything. It starts off with an understanding of what project management is. Some people, they get project management mixed up with other things. But project management is to do with projects, just projects. And a project is a temporary endeavor that you undertake to deliver a unique product, service, or results to arrive at a desired outcome. In the world of project management, we're not just focused on a deliverable. Deliverable is good, but that's not the be all end all. The deliverable is one piece, but the outcome is the more important piece. So you got a deliverable, but is it giving you that benefit and that value that you were expecting? That's the big question. Because anyone can produce a deliverable, the question is, is it fit for use? Does it conform to requirements? Does it satisfy the customer? And does it offer value enough that gives the final outcome that the customer is looking for? The final outcome could be an increase in revenue. It could be a simplification of a cumbersome process. It could be getting more clients. It could be brand recognition. It could be goodwill, many different things. So think about project management as applying knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to a project task, just a project, okay? Now, when you talk about project management in PMI lens, very recently, and I mean just the past four or five years, the PMI has started gravitating more towards agile. And they're gravitating more towards agile because the concept of agility is catching like wildfire. And at the same time, it is also delivering value when practiced the right way. So you see the PMI introducing the agile practice guide to the project management community. And on page 14 of the agile practice guide, you have the Stacy complexity model. And the Stacy model just shows you if you are in a scenario where you have requirements that are close to certainty and a technical approach that is close to certainty, you could manage that project with a simple approach. They call it a simple approach. You know. And uh, before I forget, one of our friends, Ben, who has been on this call, passed his exam a few hours ago. But Ben is winded and tired, so he's not here today, but I'm sure we'll be able to hear from Ben uh, in time to come. So, like I said, when you're talking about agile, there's a reason why you do agile projects. And you use agile because it gives you a more fluid and dynamic approach, a more fluid and dynamic system for you to be able to cope with uncertainty, for you to be able to cope with risk. You know, I call Agile a risk coping mechanism. It's a way for you to deal with uncertainty, which is what risk is, right? Risk is uncertainty that can impact your project. So on page 14, you see those things that are close, those projects that have requirements that are close to certainty, and then the technicality is close to certainty, but on the opposite end, you have those that are far from certainty in other requirements are not certain. They're unstable requirements, uncertain requirements. And then you have technicalities on certain. So for those, agile That's what PMI preaches on pages 27 and 28 in the Agile Practice Guide. So coming into project management in PMI's world, you need to have a neutral hat where you are not biased about 
oh, agile is best, or predictive is best, or hybrid has to be the way. Doesn't have to be. You know, it really depends. So for your exam, you've got to be a master of both predictive, agile, and in the middle. Now, there's not a whole lot of information about hybrid in the Agile Practice Guide, maybe at best four or five pages. And that is why I would recommend the PMP Exam Immersion book. Now, Ty, well, you don't have that yet because you're new to the program and we don't want to inundate you with, with content, content, content. But as time goes on, you will have access to this book called PMP Exam Immersion. And this will help you better embrace both worlds of agile and predictive and the hybrid piece in the middle. In fact, you'll get to understand more about hybridization as you proceed. All right, so now you understand that there are two worlds and a world in the middle. To get good with the world of predictive, my recommendation is to master the five process groups, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, and controlling, and closing. Master the 10 areas of knowledge, which are integration, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder. And master what you do in each of those knowledge areas. So in integration, we develop a project charter, we develop a project management plan, we direct and manage project work, we manage project knowledge, we monitor and control project work, we perform integrated change control, and we close the project or the phase. In scope, we plan scope management, we define scope, we collect requirements before that though. So there's a process, there's a way you do things in the world of PMI, and that's on page 25. Now, I highly recommend mastering page 25, because for me, it's like knowing where everything is in your kitchen, in your garage. It's like knowing the tools of the trade. If you don't know page 25, and I'm not saying just blind cramming, I'm not talking about blind cramming, but I'm talking about embracing it. You've got to embrace PMI's mantra and methods. You know, It makes the exam so much easier. I tell you, in my exam, what made the exam more bearable for me was the fact that I had mastered a lot. But the logic is what was hard. Understanding that the exam is not just talking about knowledge, it's talking about logic. So you could have all this ton of knowledge, but if you're not able to make sense and understand the interconnection points and the flow, you're going to find the exam hard. That's why a lot of people have knowledge. A lot of people can dump page 25, but they cannot put the pieces together. And then you have some people who can put the pieces together, but the knowledge fails them. Both of those are not what you want to do. You want to have the knowledge and you want to have the understanding of how to combine the different elements. And to be quite honest with you, the combination of the elements to make sense of the knowledge, it comes with practice. You have to practice. Like I recommend a quiz a day. Maybe it's a quiz on a knowledge area, maybe it's a quiz on Agile, it's a quiz on Scrum, but you need to exercise your PMP muscle. That's how you get good with that. All right, so we've talked about the process groups, the knowledge areas, and the processes. For Agile, my recommendation is reading through the Agile Practice Guide after going through our Agile videos, because we have a boatload of videos Devin was just talking about those videos before he got kicked off the call. Those videos from Roy and I, they're priceless. Watch the videos, comb through them, understand Agile from a bare bones perspective. And from a bare bones perspective, I'll just tell you right now, Agile is a way of thinking. It's a mindset. 
don't let anyone deceive you telling you agile is a framework that's for the uneducated the uneducated person will tell you agile is oh it's just like you know it's just like the PMBOK guide it's just like a it's a, it's a framework that's a lie the big fat lie agile is not a framework agile is a mindset it's a way that you process the world around you it's the way you think it's the way you perceive it's the way you pivot and it's the way you persevere when you need to like by pivot i mean changing your course of action by persevering i mean staying the course there are times when you should stay the course and there are times when you should pivot and an agile mind is sensitive to these things so going beyond saying agile is a mindset the next step is knowing that there is a manifesto behind this mindset and the manifesto at a very high level is all about people it's very people focused you hear in the agile manifesto values you hear the value of an agile is being individuals and interactions over processes and tools working product over comprehensive documentation customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan those four things that governs the mindset that you're meant to have you know basic thing is to collaborate to work with the customer to see your team members as being important interacting with them more important than processes and tools it's a little bit of a different way of thinking than the traditional way which is very process heavy agile is more about the people and that's why it says individuals and interactions over processes and tools you know so that is a key thing for you to embrace agile just understanding the agile manifesto values first and then we get into the principles and i'm not going to cover a whole bunch of principles but i'm going to tell you the most significant one one of the more significant ones and it says our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable i call it product they call it software but i change the word from software to product so I, as you're getting into this world at a at a high level your mindset needs to be i got to satisfy the customer i got to be people focused i got to be team focused the final one which is at the bottom of the stack of the principles at regular intervals the team tunes and adjusts it takes time out it tunes and adjusts to improve and that's the whole concept about the retrospective and the PMI calls it the single most important event in the world of agile why because if we are working without adapting and improving what good are we we're just doing the same thing expecting a different result but when you intentionally tune and adjust to a cadence you are going to get better results and that's really the story of agile at a high level now the same way predictive has frameworks like the pembok guide agile has frameworks and the two most popular and most used frameworks are scrum and kanban scrum is a 353 framework it gives you a model for you to work with a team for you to work on complex problems we have three roles the product owner the scrum master and the team you got to know these roles because if you want to practice scrum you need to know these roles and you need to obey the rules of scrum in order to get best results before you master scrum in its entirety and then you are free to scale it up even more by adding more things to it but i encourage people at a lower level just try to know what is the role of the product owner product owner is the person who knows the business who knows what the customer wants scrum master is a coach who coaches a team to excellence to practice scrum properly and then you've got the developers and the developers work to get stuff done a lot of times when we hear about frameworks in project management they are very heavily focused on projects but in the world of scrum we find a posture towards a product 
And when you have a posture towards a product, it takes away the barriers that a project often puts around what you're doing, which is, this is just for a product, a project, I beg your pardon, this is just for a project, and once the project is done, we are not really that involved. In the world of Scrum, we are concerned with the life of the product, not just there's the product. We think about the life of the product, and that's why when you have a team that puts a product together, a lot of times that same team is the same team that enhances the product even years later. So it's a different mindset, one more of a flow of continuous delivery. So we don't have the very rigid start the project, end the project. We don't have that. Instead, we have have a backlog, which is like a list of what the customer wants, and have the beginning of the sprint and the end of the sprint. Deliver what is necessary for that sprint, and you can have the conversation whether to have additional sprints. If at the end of one sprint, the customer feels value has been delivered, that's it. But if at the end of one sprint, customer still wants to keep going and there's going to be a second sprint and a third sprint, well, you just keep going. So sprint one could end up going to sprint 10. It really depends. So it's not as rigid. Even though we could plan at a high level in a product roadmap, we could have release planning. It doesn't mean that it has to rigidly follow that. You know, it's not promising that this is how the course is going to be. It's just saying these are options, you know, as far as delivering the value. All right, so we have three roles. We have five ceremonies in Scrum. The sprint itself, the sprint is just like this. It's a container. It's a container in which everything that we're doing in the sprint goes. So the sprint is the first event. In the sprint, we have sprint planning, which is planning for the sprint. We have the daily scrum, just like this one we're having now, the daily scrum. Then we have the sprint review and we have the sprint retrospective. So we have four things in the sprint and the sprint itself, and that makes five. Now, there's an informal ceremony, which we call the sprint, uh, we, we call the uh, backlog refinement. It's not formal. It's an informal ceremony, but a lot of teams do it. It just makes sense to do it as a team and to put it to a cadence. But some people don't. They just let the product owner do it on their own. Uh, but it's advised wherever you see it necessary to have backlog refinement put on the map. So let's talk about them one by one. The sprint is just that. It's a container. It's the iteration itself. Um, then we have the daily scrum, which is like what we're doing, giving accountability, um, syncing up, trying to understand what we're doing. Uh, and working together as a team. And then we have the sprint review, and the sprint review is where we are reviewing, um, the customer is reviewing, the stakeholders are reviewing what we created during the sprint. And then we have the uh, sprint retrospective where we are looking back and saying, what went well, what didn't go so well, what can we improve on, and pretty much bonding as a team to discover ways forward, the way forward of, of whatever our process looks like. And then we have the three artifacts. The artifacts are the product backlog, which is the list of everything that the customer wants. Then we have a sprint backlog, which is a subset of the product backlog just for that sprint alone. And then we have the potentially shippable increment, also known as the increment or increment. At the end of each sprint, we have a little bit of whatever we're working on, and that is the increment. I usually give an example of a sprint to create the cover of my flask here. And then we have another sprint to create the body of the flask. So even though this is done, right, is this giving us enough functionality to actually use? No. What about when we create the mug? Is that enough functionality? No. What about a drink inside? That could be the third sprint. And then is that all? Um, well, it's hot here in Arizona. <clears throat> I would like some ice. <clears throat> so we have a fourth sprint for the ice. And we are continuously integrating, making sure everything fits, continuously testing. But when all is said and done, now we can release 
the work of four sprints. So we're not looking to release every sprint, but we should be ready to ship. In other words, what we're working on should be complete. That's the idea. And you want to adjust your sprint length to where it makes sense. You know, there's no point doing a two-day sprint and you're not even anywhere near complete. Or doing a two-week sprint and your work is so huge that you're not able to break it up into chunks that are truly done. Or you're not able to identify a done definition that makes sense to do it in two weeks. So whatever industry you're working on, make sure that when you set your sprints, they make sense. In the world of Scrum, the maximum we talk about is four weeks. In the world of Scrum, a sprint is four weeks or less. Okay? And that's Scrum. Now, Kanban, on the other side, is very straightforward. What you need to work Kanban is a Kanban board. And you start where you are with Kanban. And the board is broken up into three lanes of to do, doing, and done. You have what you're going to do. You have a doing column as you begin to work whatever those requests or requirements are you move them from to do into doing and for doing you want to have a not to uh, a work in process limit where you do not exceed a certain number of items at any point in time because you have only so many uh, hours in a day and there's only one of you anyway so if you're working five things at any one time as an individual, that doesn't make sense. So we usually limit what everyone is working on to one. So you could have a team of five or a team of six. And based on the availability, the bandwidth, the capacity, you have work in process limits. And that's what guides us as we work in Kanban. So it's not a free for all. You don't just throw anything on the board into doing. You actually make sure that you have the, the bandwidth, the capacity to do it. And um, at the end of the day, we have something we talk about that's not on the exam, but it helps us understand how Kanban works. It's called Little's Law. And the summary of Little's Law is stop starting, stop finishing. Stop starting all this stuff because the more stuff you have going on, work in progress, the less you're going to end up getting done in the long run. Okay. And that's the story. I just wanted to share a little story of project management. So for your exam, you got to master predictive, you got to master agile, you got to understand the world of hybrid on page 27 and 28. The immersion book can give you some more context for that. But the way to get to excellence is, I tell you, it's a quiz a day. You know, I don't care however many times you take a quiz. If you're maxed out of quizzes, then you've done really well because on the Prazion portal, we have two PMP mock exams. We have a CAPM mock exam, which I advise as well, and I know Paris has taken all three of those. And then we have an inordinate amount of tiny little quizzes here and there, and I'm always coming out with new ones and also introducing PMI's quizzes to the mix when we meet in the daily scrum. So my recommendation to you is jump on a quiz a day. There was one that I, I released not too long ago. It had five questions. And those five questions are kind of like discovery because there's stuff that you definitely wouldn't know there. But I encourage you to keep taking uh, five questions a day. Um, if you go to the learning system, you'll find it there. I call it the Agile Discovery Quiz. Okay. And that's all I have for today, my friends. Any questions? We all good? All right. I'll go ahead and end the recording. So sunny here, I can barely see my phone. All right, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and end.